distinguished Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth, Lord Jonathan Sachs, Lady Elaine Sachs, Professor Erwin Cutler, Rabbi Strauchler, Rabbi J. Kelman, Elliot Malamed, worthy rabbis, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julia Koshitsky, and I'm deeply honored and consider it a great privilege to welcome all of you here this evening to the Sher Shemayim congregation to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Torah in Motion. And we thank you, Rabbi Strauchler, for hosting us this evening. <clears throat> Over the past nine years, Torah in Motion has had a profound impact not only in our own community of Toronto, but with the lives of thousands in the four corners of the globe, spanning 31 countries. Torah in Motion has become an internationally recognized organization known for its innovative programming and creativity. We are proud of the diversity of our 300 speakers who have represented differences of opinion. As the late Rabbi Pinchas Peli, a distinguished commentator on Parsha HaShavua, once remarked in his book, Torah Today, Torah was passed on to posterity, not as closed, boxed-in wisdom, but as open-ended, ongoing conversations. Torah in Motion has enabled these kinds of conversations to reach 6,000 people who have joined our email list with more than 30,000 MP3s downloaded from its online library and classes. And tonight, by popular demand, as you can see by the screen behind me, there are many communities who have asked for this to be televised and screened in Denver, Ottawa, Montreal, New York, and in Teaneck. For all this and much, much more, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to Rabbi Jay Kelman and Elliot Malamed, the architects of Torah in Motion. <laughs> and not to be forgotten, also to Rabbi Kelman's wife, Ilana, who adds her own blend of knowledge, expertise, and passion to the endeavor. Tonight is indeed a perfect opportunity to collectively express our heartfelt appreciation to them for their vision, their dedication, and pursuit of excellence in bringing Torah education to so many thousands of people. I would like to ask them to please stand and be recognized. Ilana. A few days ago, I asked Rabbi Jay Kelman how he chose the name Torah in Motion, to which he replied that while he and his wife Ilana were designing the first website, the name just resonated, reflecting the conviction that Torah can never be static. Torah that is not in motion runs the risk of becoming irre irrelevant, antiquated, and dated. How meaningful that this week's Torah portion opens with the words, Lech lecha, meaning go, move, do not stand still. Our guest speaker tonight, Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, has written in one of his many books, and I chose a letter in the scroll, the following on page 58. <laughs> Judaism is a uniquely restless faith. Jews are always traveling, dissatisfied with the status quo, and never quite merging with their environment. For Judaism, faith is the discord between the world that is and the world as it ought to be. Given these sentiments, how appropriate and fortunate that tonight our guest speaker will be introduced by Professor Erwin Cutler, member of Canadian Parliament, someone who has been a staunch, articulate, outspoken champion in the pursuit of Judaic vision of social justice. Someone. Someone who has spent so much of his waking hours dissatisfied with the status quo, forever trying to transform the world into what it ought to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I take great pride in presenting to you our very own beloved Professor Erwin Cutler.
Julie, thank you really for those very kind and, and warm words of introduction. They're particularly appreciated because they come from such an anxious chayil as yourself. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be able to be here and participate, indeed, be as we all are, the beneficiary of yet another Torah in Motion creative initiative. As Julie said, this is a real center of excellence. And Professor Malamet and Rabbi Kelman, his wife Alana, deserve all the credit and more with respect to creating a chinuch, an ongoing educational resonance, not only in Toronto, but internationally. And for me, it's a particular privilege, a particular schut, an honor to be able to introduce Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. There are many rabbis of whom it can be said of them in Toronto and elsewhere that they are great rabbis. There are many scholars of whom it can be said they are prolific writers. There are many Jewish and public intellectuals, public intellectuals generally, who enlighten public discourse and debate. And there are moral as well as intellectual leaders, too few regrettably, who engage in tikkun olam, in the betterment of the human condition. But I know only one person, one person, of whom it can be said that he is a great rabbi who is at home in both the university and the yeshiva, who is a scholar whose work is as profound as it is prolific, who is a leading Jewish and public intellectual, who shapes as he enlightens public discourse and debate, and who is a great moral as well as intellectual leader. A true Maimonidian, when I think of Rabbi Sachs, the word that always comes to me, the feeling that always comes to me, is this is really a more nevuchim. This is a person who is a guide for the perplexed in our time. And that is why for me it's so moving to be here, as I'm sure we all feel in his presence. As the chief rabbi, now commemorating the 20th anniversary of his stewardship of the chief rabbi of the Commonwealth, so he's the chief rabbi of each of us uh, here in, in this room as well. Rabbi Sachs has had a transformative impact on British Jewry and beyond, dramatically enhancing, deepening the Jewish identity of British Jews at the same time as enhancing and deepening the sense of citizenship of British Jews. Something that I myself have witnessed over time, over these last 20 years, where he launched two programs, two 10-year programs, one with respect to Jewish continuity, the other with respect to Jewish responsibility. And when he asks the question, will we have Jewish grandchildren, it's because of Rabbi Sachs that in Britain today, there will be more and more Jewish grandchildren and great-grandchildren. As a scholar and the author, incredibly, when one thinks of everything else that Rabbi Sachs is doing and has responsibility for. He's been the author of 24 books from biblical commentary to moral philosophy. From speaking of Jewish civilization and its inter intersection with human civilizations. His, result, his writings, as I said, are as compelling as they are profound. And it's interesting, Julie, because you mentioned letter in the scroll. My wife always has a book of Rabbi Sachs on the night table. The book that she always goes back to is a letter in the scroll. The book that my daughter Michal has been reading in Israel is a letter in the scroll. The book that my grandson, Roy, who's to be bar mitzvah in Israel next August, is now reading is letter in the scroll. And the page that she refers to, incredibly enough, is page 58. 
Uh, the same page you referred to, and since you drew on it, I don't have to mention it again. But what my wife always says about uh, Rabbi Sachs is that if you read the letter in a scroll, for non-religious Jews or even non-believing Jews, they will have an understanding of what Jewish values are all about in its profound sense. For religious Jews, they will understand and have their message and values validated. And for non-Jews, they will intersect with the whole of human civilization. As it has been put and commented upon that Jonathan Sachs' voice carries unique moral authority beyond the Jewish community. As a Jewish intellectual, indeed leading public intellectual, as I mentioned, he has influenced and inspired both Jewish and public discourse and their intersection, and one of many, many vignettes that I remember was his, his incredible opening speech at the founding London conference to combat anti-Semitism, the first ever inter-parliamentary conference to combat anti-Semitism. A speech which was profoundly Jewish in its historicist particularity and profoundly human in its compelling universality where there was no divides, where each intersected and enlivened the other. As a moral leader, as a moren nebuchim, as I said, of whom it can be said, and I think all of us here in this room can say it and feel it in our own special way when we think of Rabbi Jonathan, mikom lam dai skalti, that we all have learned and been the beneficiary of his wisdom. I know the quote, uh, I just picked it up tonight when we were having dinner, the book on partnership, and the quote that hit me again, and I just mentioned that the Bible first taught the sanctity of life, the dignity of the individual, the importance of peace, the moral limits of power. Capacity to sum up in one sentence what some people might take volumes and may not be able to achieve. And may I close with a teaching of Pirkei Avot that is familiar to us here, which speaks really as Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai says, what is the good that a person should cherish? What are really the qualities to be able to choose the right path? And as we remember that Rabbi Eliezer will say, Ayin Taba, to have, and it's not just an analytical sense, it's something that Rabbi Sachs uh, said over dinner uh, this evening. Don't judge somebody in, until and it's as if you were in their place, which is part of a larger approach that he has, uh, really, look for the good that you can see in every person. So Ayin Tova is really that kind of neshama disposition. It's not only a matter of rationality or intellect, it comes from the soul. And this brings me to what Rabbi Yahshua then goes on, Chaver Tov, to have a good companion. And then, you know, we are told in the Midrash that means to have a good wife, an Eza Nekdo. And here, I was reading again tonight uh, in the book in partnership, what he says about you, Elaine, the beautiful words in which he dedicates the book to you and says, whose kindness makes gentle the life of this world and whose faith in people has been my inspiration. And here's where you see where Hevei Dan et Kol Adam Lachaf Schut comes from. Then Rabbi Yossi says, Shachen Tov, to be a good neighbor. And being a good neighbor means not only having a good neighbor, but yourself being a good neighbor. And then Rabbi Shimon says, Haro'et Hanolad, to have foresight. And all his readings, all his, this thing, you know, my, I would tell you a joke about what my son says about me and technology, but I'll save it. Maybe I'll tell it just before I close. But the, 
<laughs> Rabbi Shimon says, Haro'eh et hanolad. To have that sense of foresight, and to have that sense of foresight is because one is anchored, anchored deeply and profoundly in one's Jewish heritage. But then, in the end, you have <clears throat> Rabbi Elazar saying, Lev Tov, a good heart. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai concludes by saying, I prefer the words of Rabbi Elazar about the importance of a good heart, of Lev Tov, because in his words, all the rest is included. And so when I say that Rabbi Sachs is a Moren Nebuchim, I, my Manetian guide to the perplexed in our time, it is because he has, with everything else that I mentioned, a wonderful heart, a Lev Tov, all the rest is commentary. Good evening. My name is Dr. Elliot Malamut. Um, Chief Rabbi, the last time I interviewed you in 2009, it was in your house in London. Uh, this time around, it's a little more crowded. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming. This event has been years in the planning. I first approached the Chief Rabbi's office in 2004. And I'm very pleased that we can see this dialogue come to fruition. I'm Evin Yavin. <laughs> On behalf of Rabbi Jay and Mrs. Alana Kelman and myself, I want to thank very much uh, the Chief Rabbi staff in London, uh, Valerie Sheridan and Joanna Benarosh, for helping us in so many ways to facilitate this, and also to our staff, to Ayala Eisenstadt and Lily Feynman, for their incredible efforts, their patience, their good humor, to our tech team of Shalom Eisenstadt and David Callender for their wonderful work as always, and to the staff here at Chair Shemayim, especially Carol Handelman and Lance Davis, for their support and their tremendous competence. Thank you. <laughs> and last note, I'd like to invite everyone here, if you haven't already purchased tickets, to come down tomorrow evening to the Isabel Bader Theater at the University of Toronto, where I'll be moderating a dialogue between the Chief Rabbi and Professor Charles Taylor, one of the preeminent philosophers in the world today. We'll be discussing the future of religion in a secular age, and I, I hope very much you can join us. Chief Rabbi, a central theme of Future Tense is one you've pursued throughout your career. The Jews are not alone in the world. Despite the fact of numerous external challenges to the Jewish people in Israel and the diaspora, you argue that, quote, today, Jews are not victims, not powerless, and do not stand alone, unquote. And you add to that to think in such terms is counterproductive and dysfunctional. Now, the devil's advocate argument, of course, which I'm sure you know, would be to assert that given the rise of anti-Semitism in many quarters and the demonization and delegitimization of Israel inside the UN and without, that Jews have every reason to feel that they're fighting a lonely battle in the modern world. Could you please explain to our audience why Jews should, in your words, take a stand not motivated by fear, not driven by paranoia or a sense of victimhood, but a positive stand on the basis of Jewish values. Oh, right, sorry. Uh, Elliot, I, I, I wonder if you would forgive me if I just briefly respond because, uh, uh, you know, be, I, I must say some personal thanks um, to uh, all of you, to uh, uh, Julia, to Erwin. Uh, sorry about your mobile phone. I, once thought that we might resolve some of the difficulties in understanding Torah on the theory that God gave the Torah by mobile phone. Um, <laughs> or maybe your reception is better in Toronto <laughs> than it is in London. Uh, but I thank Julia and Owen for your words and as a former American ambassador to Britain, Ray Seitz once said, compliments are fine so long as you don't inhale. <laughs> so can I begin by saying that uh, in Julia Kaczynski and in Professor Owen Kaufman, you have two of the real heroes of today's Jewish world. And in a community 
like Toronto that has many heroes. And we salute you and we say to Hashem, may he continue to bless you and may you continue to bless us. I, I want to put, say a personal thank you to everyone here at Sharei Shemayim for being our host this evening and to wish your new rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Strauch, Lavrocha Vatzlacha and all he does. You're very lucky to have him and we wish him and the community continued growth. Um, Torah in Motion is a brilliant program and I too salute Rabbi Joe Kelman and Elliot and everyone involved in this program and you are absolutely right. Torah is of its essence in motion. We are between Noah and Lech Lecha. And that is the real difference between last week and this week. Noah means to rest, rest content, Menucha, your static. Whereas the words we always associate with Avram are Lech Lecha, uh, always moving, always growing, always challenging. And then when both Julia and uh, Owen mentioned page 58 of Leisure in the Scroll, I have to say I only write the books, I never read them. Um, <laughs> I got terribly worried since 58 is Gematria Noah. <laughs> Whereas Lech Lecha is Gematria 100, so I better be careful to write some good stuff on page 100 of the next book I write. <laughs> and finally, may I say what a privilege it is to be in this great community of Toronto, or everyone said Toronto, so I'm not sure which is. <laughs> it's a community that I so admire, one of the great Jewish communities of the world. You are passionate for Israel, you're passionate for Jewish day school education. You had the cycle to put every Jewish institution in Bathurst Street, which is absolutely <laughs> If that ain't a sign of incipient Jewish unity, I wouldn't accuse you of having achieved it yet, but at least incipient, you're all on the same road, you're all in the same road. <laughs> so, Kalakava to all of you, and it's a privilege to be here. And now, Elliot, would you remind me what the question is? <laughs> Look, I, the answer is very simple. Okay, so some people don't like us very much. Now, 90%, forgive me, that's their problem. Bad things happen, so some of it is our problem. But the question is, how do we respond? And let me be very blunt with you, Elliot. There is a horrendous thing that happened. None of us, none of us should pass judgment on European Jewry in the 19th century. But European Jewry in the 19th century made a horrendous mistake, which all of us would have made, I think, in the same circumstances. They said this, non-Jews don't like us very much. You know, the 19th century was a horrific moment for European Jewry, because on the one hand, all the rhetoric was enlightenment, emancipation, Jews are going to have equal rights, you're the same as us. But that same century of emancipation was the century that saw the birth of racial anti-Semitism. And already by 1862, Moses Hess could see this. And uh, Jews internalized this anti-Semitism. And they said, why do Gentiles hate us? Must be because we're different. So therefore, let's stop being different and they won't hate us anymore. And so, they don't like us because we don't eat in their homes, we'll give up kashras. They don't like us because we pray in a strange language, we'll pray in English. Etc., etc., etc. And they took every move to divest themselves of everything that made Jews different. Did that reduce anti-Semitism by one millimeter? Not by one. And... I don't know if you've read, as it come out here in Canada, a very moving book uh, by somebody called Edmund de Waal called The Hair with Amber Eyes. Has it come out? And it tells the story of a remarkable Jewish family that I didn't know about, the Efrusi family, about Charles Efrusi, this great esthete, 
uh, Jewish banking family, like almost second only to the Rothschilds in the 19th century, about Charles Ephrussi in Paris, about Victor Ephrussi in Vienna. These were people at the very peak of society. And yet, like that, you know, in 1938, the Anschluss, every, you know, and before that in Paris, you know, when Louis Drouin uh, wrote that book, La France Juive, you know, which was a virulently anti-Semitic book in the 1880s that became a bestseller in France and remained a bestseller there were 200 editions of that book produced between the 1880s and 1945. And then Vienna and the Anschluss have, you know, all of that attempt to be like everyone else. Jews cannot cure anti-Semitism. The victim cannot cure the crime. The hated cannot cure the hate. Who are the only people who can cure anti-Semitism? The people who lead the cultures that give rise to anti-Semitism. And therefore, we need friends and allies. And that is why the work of the, the people in London in organizing that conference and the wonderful work that Owen does here in Canada, England and Canada became the first two countries where the fight against anti-Semitism was led by non-Jews. And we owe those non-Jews a tremendous debt. And what happens when you go out to make friends? You know, I was very touched by um, your reference to the book A Letter in the Scroll. You know that book is not called A Letter in the Scroll. In England, it's called Radical Then, Radical Now. It was then translated uh, into Ivrit. And my, I have two brothers who made Aliyah, and uh, it's called, uh, you know, Radical Azra. And my, my brother, who's a big mischief, whom you know, I think, said, you know, Jonathan, your book has just come out in America, in Israel. It's called Ridiculous Then, Ridiculous Now. <laughs> in England, it was called Radical Then, Radical Now, because in England, my books are read by non-Jews. And I want you to understand this. That book was serialized in the Times. Now, this is a book about Jewish pride. And I said to the editor, the deputy editor of the Times, um, you know, Jews are one, less than one half of 1% of the population. The readership of the Times is 99.5% non-Jews. I said to the uh, deputy editor of the Times, Michael Gove, why are you publishing this? This is about Jewish identity. He said, this non-Jew, because you're our chief rabbi. Now go figure this. This is 2000. Today, 11 years later, Michael Gove is no longer the deputy editor of the Times. He entered Parliament uh, and is today Secretary of State for Education and will get up in any gathering, Jewish or non-Jewish, and tell a non-Jewish public, number one, you want something to admire? Jewish day schools. And then he will go on and say, you want something else to admire? the state of Israel. Now here is a non-Jew who has become the biggest single defender of the state of Israel in the current government and the biggest single supporter of Jewish education. In 2002, May 2002, you remember what May 2002 was? We had the suicide bombing at its height, that horrendous bombing at, at uh, the Park Hotel Netanya, Erev Pesach. Uh, then Janine, you know, the reply. It was a horrifically tense moment between Jews and Muslims in Britain. May 2002, the Queen, Her Majesty, I should stand when I say that, but you take the point, uh, gave a little reception for Kolma Minim, Shehul of Faiths in Britain, uh, in Buckingham Palace. And towards the end, I am approached by um, a very Haredi Muslim who comes up to me and says, Chief Rabbi, you're the Chief Rabbi, aren't you? Um, I said, yes. He said, my wife wants a word with you. <laughs> and she comes towards me with a big hijab, and I'm dreading what she's going to say. And she comes up to me and says, Chief Rabbi, I just want to thank you for radical then, radical now, for letter in the scroll. Go figure. You stand up for your faith. Other people respect you for that. You see yourself as a victim, other people will see, yourself as, see you as a victim. You have to do the opposite thing. 
One month earlier, in April 2002, the Union of Jewish Students came to me saying, you know, um, there's a lot of anti-Israel and anti-Jewish sentiment on campus. And I sat down with the Union of Jewish Students and I said, you are going to do the unexpected thing. They call this in psychotherapy paradoxical intervention. Your response to anti-Semitism on campus is that you are going to lead the fight against Islamophobia. Out of that initiative came an organization which is very prominent today in Britain called the Coexistence Trust, Jews and Muslims fighting anti-Semitism and Islamophobia together. And that is now a group that has tremendous presence in the Houses of Parliament and in British political life and is a model for all other communities. You want to fight anti-Semitism? The simplest account I can give when anyone asks me is the profound words of one of the greatest Jewish mystics of all time, Nachman of Bratzlav, which is so simple that we teach them as a song to our five-year-old children, Kol alam kulo geshet samaod, life isn't easy. It's full of dangers. Vaika shalola fachet klal. The main thing is never to be afraid. If you walk tall, if you have absolute confidence, you go out to make friends, you win those friends. And with friends like those, we will fight anti Semitism and we will win. Since everyone has been talking about radical then, radical now, we'll mention it. Um, I remember when I read the book the first time, and I was very struck by the opening, especially. If you haven't read the book, in the opening of the book, there's a group of students who came to Rabbi Sachs and asked them, him about uh, their college project. So he told them to send out a survey to Jews of diverse backgrounds, asking what, a Jew meant, what being a Jew meant to them. So, very few of them answered the survey, but those that did, there was actually a resounding negativity about their Jewishness. And in fact, it was perhaps, to my mind, best encapsulated by one man who quoted an Israeli boy who viewed Judaism as a hereditary illness. That's what the boy said, it's a hereditary illness. So when the man asked him, why do you consider it a hereditary illness? He said, because you get it from your parents and you pass it down to your children, and not a small number of people have died from it. So that's a pretty chilling thing to say about being Jewish. So the book focuses in large part about on Judaism as a revolution, as a revolution, as a radical wholesale change in not only the prevalent outlooks of the ancient world, but in the history of humankind. Now my question to you is that many Jews today view Judaism as a kind of ancient, somewhat antiquated system. So I wonder if you can articulate why you see Judaism as revolutionary, and also why it's not perceived by more Jews that way as a, as a radical faith. Because, you know, we practice Judaism without thinking about it. And that is bad news because, you know, Jews, and even Sigmund Freud saw this in his last work, Moses and Monotheism. Well, well, thinkers, we always preferred the intellectual to the physical. And somehow or other, something went wrong. Um, you know, 1756, Voltaire wrote a virulently anti-Semitic article about Jews and Judaism in which he said Jews have contributed nothing new to civilization, not in the arts, not in the sciences, not in philosophy, not even in religion. 1756. Over the next 200 years, we produced geniuses in every single field, in physics, Einstein, in sociology, Durkheim, in Levi-Strauss, uh, in anthropology, Levi-Strauss, in philosophy, Bergson, Wittgenstein, everyone from Irving Berlin to Isaiah Berlin, you name it, they were Jewish. In psychoanalysis, they had to have Jung there as the token Gentile. I mean, everyone else was Jewish. Mind you, who else needs psychoanalysis? 
when it came to apikarsim, we get, we get, we, you know, of the four great apikarsim of the modern age, three of them were Jewish. Spinoza, Marx, Freud. The only one who wasn't Jewish was Charles Darwin. Why Charles Darwin wasn't Jewish, I'm not sure. He had <laughs> long beard, total apikaris. He had every qualification. I had to come to the conclusion that Darwin was a random genetic mutation. <laughs> But every one of those intellectuals was estranged from Judaism. So we had this unbelievably uh, profound people asking challenging and profound questions, coming up with radically new ways of seeing the world. And at the same time, they were turning their backs on Judaism, and Judaism retreated and retreated until they became afraid to ask the deep questions. And that is really, really bad news. But Judaism remains radical. For instance, let me give you a for instance, which to me was really rather strange. About two years ago, when was the climate conference on climate change in Copenhagen? You remember that one? All the world's governments came. So it's interesting, you know, that, that the government uh, came to the faith leaders in Britain before they sent uh, uh, the minister to Copenhagen. They wanted to know what we had to say. Um, so we had all the faiths there, so I told them, you know, what do you need to solve the world's climate, uh, 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 global warming and, and, and climate change? Well, what about Shabbos? One day in seven, no driving, no planes, no uh, this, that and the other. You would solve the world's energy crisis and climate crisis as a stroke. They're sitting there with their mouths open. <laughs> An imam comes up to me and says, you know, Chief Rabbi, I never thought of that before. I'm going to tell all our imams to tell people not to drive to the mosque on Friday. <laughs> I wish I could get some rabbis to say that. You know. <laughs> so climate change, the Bible, the Torah and, uh, contains uh, in, in, in uh, Parshas Bahar and uh, in Sefer Devarim, the world's first environmental legislation. When the big issue of international debt came up towards the millennium in the late 1990s, it was the Vatican, it was the, the United Nations, sorry, uh, and the World Bank or the IMF or what have you, that came up with this campaign for international debt relief called Jubilee 2000. And it was based on Vayikra chapter 25 and Shemitat Kesafim. This was the great idea, and it's 3,300 years ago. What astonished me, because we've been out of Britain now, we've been in motion, I've got to tell you, you know, I asked... We've been running around from Chicago to Boston to New York to Washington to here, and I'm asking my staff to phone me up every day just to tell me where I am. And, uh, and so I, I, I just picked up on my emails yesterday and today, yesterday in the Daily Telegraph and today in the Evening Standard, uh, two non-Jewish journalists. Um, because there's a, do you have here an Occupy Wall Street movement here? And, uh, and in New York, certainly, we really saw it there. And some people in America have been worried about some anti-Semitic tendencies among the protesters. Have you, have you seen that? Okay, so on Thursday, somebody called Christina O'Doni in the Telegraph, and today somebody called Matthew Dancona uh, in the Evening Standard have said, in effect, Chief Rabbi, could you come home? We need you because they are camped outside St. Paul's Cathedral, and the church is not sure whether to be for or against or what have you. And both of them said, um, the chief rabbi has been the one voice that has defended on the one hand the market economy, and on the other hand, the need for ethics in economics. Because the first thing, almost the first thing I set up when I became chief rabbi was the Jewish Association of Business Ethics. So here our defense of market economics on the one hand, but our insistence on tzedakah and chesed, distributive justice and the alleviation of poverty on the other, turns out to be absolutely as new as today's and yesterday's newspapers. So I think Judaism, every way you look, 
continues to be radical. And I, I'm, I'm just sorry that we don't see it. I really, I'm sorry. So why, why the disconnect then? In other words, why doesn't the message get through? We're not manifesting it properly. We're not communicating it properly. We're not disseminating it properly. If the message is good, but the messenger, but the people don't hear it, what's, where's the impasse? Where's the block? I don't know. I try and read a lot of books. Um, you know, I, I, my, I must mention one of the great influences on my life, my Rav, who came to London from Toronto, from Clanton Park Shul. Rabbi Nochem Rabinovich uh, Shlita, one of the great, great Rabbanim and thinkers of our time, with whom I learned daily for 12 years, and to whom I owe everything. And um, you know, I said to him, I, I suffer from insomnia, and he said, could you tell me the technique? Lalnitna uh, Laila <laughs> El So, you know, I read a lot. I surf Amazon.com a lot. I buy a lot of books, and I read in every kind of discipline. And I'm constantly arguing now, you know, ans asking, where does that connect with Torah? And I think you, and I call this in, in future tense in my new book, um, Torah v'chokhmah. So I think you need to sort of place yourself in these disciplines, whether it's neuroscience or evolutionary psychology or it's cosmology or it's uh, economic theory or games theory. And you constantly, if, you're, if your mind is open and you look at the wisdom of the world, you actually will see new things in Torah. And the person who said this was Rav Tzadok HaKohen Milublin, who said, since we say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Istakel Baraisa Vara Alma, since the Torah is the blueprint of the world, and since we say HaMachadosh Beduva Bechol Yom Maaseh Bereshis, that God renews the world every day, then we should take the renewal of the world and it will allow us to see new faces in Torah. So that's the way I do it. I mean, sometimes students come to me with this sort of thorny problem that I know you've wrestled with, which is that many students today are universalists. So when you try and teach Judaism to them, their attitude is, um, there's good stuff everywhere, and they don't understand Jewish particularism. So if Judaism is true, then why were Jews not commanded to go out and convert everyone to the, you know, to the one true faith? And if all people are made in God's image and are indeed God's children, then, then how can any religion be singled out as true above and beyond others? You know, for many years in education, this is what I've heard. Along the same lines, how can a certain people be called chosen? What does that mean? And so on. So how would you respond to the dilemma that moderns have with the idea of, trumpeting or championing one faith, one idea, one people above others. Well, you know, I tell the story about the late Rav Shlomo Kalbach, of blessed memory, who spent a lifetime going around campuses, and then towards the end of his life he said, I go to see students, and I ask them what they are, and if somebody says I'm a Protestant, I know that's a Protestant. And if somebody says I'm a Catholic, I know that's a Catholic. And if somebody says I'm just a human being, I know that's a Jew. <laughs> Where did we ever get this crazy idea? One of the most radical Jewish ideas ever. And it is the idea most necessary for the world in the 21st century, is that tzadike or chasidei umos olam yesh lahem chelek olam haba. That the righteous, the nations of all the world have a share in the world to come. That meant that Judaism never held extra ecclesiam non est salus, that outside our faith, there's no way to heaven. We never said that. Now in a plural world, we need the Jewish teaching. When I, in the uh, summer of 2000, addressed the United Nations, we had the modestly entitled uh, Millennium Peace Summit. You can tell how effective we were this week. 
all the religious leaders of the world came together in the summer of 2000, they declared world peace, and just a year later we got 9-11, so we, we weren't that great. But um, uh, there was an Indian guru who said to me, Rabbi Sachs, I would like you to be a keynote speaker in our counter-conference. And I said, what's your counter-conference? He said, the World Conference of Non-Evangelizing Faiths. And I began to realize that that is what speaks to so many people about Jews. Jews serve God, but they don't force it on anyone else. They don't try and conquer or convert the world. It's our most radical thing. And therefore, I had to bring about a way of expressing this very complex idea in a simple way. And I meditated on it for several years, and eventually I came up with the phrase, the dignity of difference. Abraham was told, leave behind all the things that make people the same, their land, their birthplace, their culture, their father's house. Go and be different. Why? To teach the world the dignity of difference. And I road tested this. Every year, Elena and I give a reception about June, just after the close of the academic year, for the leadership of the National Union of Students, not the Jewish students, the non-Jewish students. We feel, because Israel coming under attack, we need to have the students as a whole on our side, and they really are, they've been heroic. And I tested, I, each year I give them a shear before the reception, and I road tested on these non-Jewish students the dignity of difference, the concept. And I saw these guys, Hindu Sikhs, guys from the Caribbean, walking, leaving the room, walking an inch taller. And I suddenly realized it works for them. We always knew we were different, but we always thought that was bad news. Now the chief rabbi is telling us it's good news. And because it worked on them, I realized it worked, full stop. Now you may feel that London University is very anti-Semitic or anti-Israel, but if you walk along Gower Street, you will come to ULU, the, Union of Lond uh, the University of London Union. Look to one side as you come through the front door. On the wall, outside, is a plaque. And it is a quote from Dignity of Difference, uh, and, you know, with author, Chief Rabbi Sachs. And it says the following, because we are all different. We each have something unique to contribute. And the students, the non-Jewish students, took that as their message. So we are the people who believe in a particular faith and a universal God. The miracle of monotheism, we say, is not one God, one truth, one way for all humankind. The miracle of monotheism is that unity up there creates diversity down here. And that I had to do it that way so that we would not see particularism as a reason for disengaging with the world or considering ourselves superior to the world. And yet it seems sometimes that that message gets lost in the sort of attacks on religion that are so much a part of contemporary life. I have many students who quote a lot more from you know, Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens than they do from the Torah and the Talmud. And that's a trend that is growing, right? What the, what the nation called the new atheists is in vogue. And they attack religion with flourish as the province of irrationality and even fanaticism. And they, they capture spots on bestseller lists. And for believers, it's, it's actually perturbing to read some of the arguments because the methodology is often to portray the very worst elements of religion or particular historical incidents in religion and to convey them as a typical representation of the faith. Now, I'm wondering why you think that this has become so popular now, to deride religion as negative, as simple-minded, as destructive. Um, is it because those people who are condemning religion are only viewing its worst aspects and can't be bothered really to portray a more nuanced picture? Or are they actually picking up on real problems within religious communities that sort of fail to create and to communicate a more sophisticated, a more nurturing message of the best that religion has to offer. Why, why is this so in vogue? Well, Elliot, as you know, that's my next book. Um, it's, it's come out in Britain already. 
Uh, it's coming out here in the in States and Canada next year. It's called The Great Partnership, God, Science, and the Search for Meaning, and it's my response to Richard Dawkins. Uh, just uh, 10 days ago, I met Richard for the first time. We did a 45-minute conversation together on BBC, and... Uh, um, I actually liked him. I mean, I, I'm terribly embarrassed to say this. And he liked me. I think we're actually going to get on because uh, uh, I said, you know, if we invited you for dinner, would you come? And he didn't say only if it's Trafe. I mean, he said... <laughs> <laughs> he actually said, I'd love that, you know. So if we can convince Richard Dawkins that in Judaism we value an Apicurus more highly than an Amhoorit, then maybe he'll become a Jewish atheist. <laughs> um, but that book is a serious attempt to move the argument on. I mean, showing you no, enough already, you know, that this new atheism uh, is not new. Um, it is a rather um, simplified and simplistic repeat of arguments that came from Hume and Kant and were said a lot better by Bertrand Russell. And uh, so it's absolutely ridiculous. Why has it happened? It has happened because of that uh, phenomenon most memorably described almost a cliche now by W.B. Yeats. You know, uh, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The, be uh, the best, like all conviction, while the worst, are full of passionate intensity. When a civilization is at its prime, science and religion walk hand in hand. The society and religion walk hand in hand. And that's how, you know, America and Britain were between roughly 1850 and 1950, something like that. But when that balance is disturbed, then you get movements towards the extremes. Uh, the secularists become more aggressive. The religious turn inward because they say the world doesn't understand us, it hates us. And then they be turn inward and they move from, in secular terminology, from being a church to being a sect. And both are hostile towards one another. And once there's that dynamic of hostility, it's extremely hard to do anything at all because uh, the vociferous voices, the radical atheists and the religious fundamentalists shout louder than anyone else. And frankly, somebody's got to step in and say, um, you know, there is common ground here and can we, we're not going to convert the radical atheists and we're not going to convert the radical fundamentalists, but we have to be strong and firm in our conviction that um, science and religion do belong together. And I am proud to be a member of a religion that 2,000 years ago coined a bracha on seeing an eminent scientist, Jewish or non-Jewish, religious or secular. So Judaism has always valued science and seen it as having religious dignity. And that takes a lot of the sting out of Richard Dawkins. I mean, this equation of faith with fundamentalism, do you see that as a kind of passing thing? Is that just sort of exacerbated by 9-11 anxiety and this ubiquitous discussion of Islamic terrorism? Or is there something actually more permanent? What I'm getting at is that are we in the final stages of something that the Enlightenment wrought, um, that you talk about in One People, that McIntyre talks about in After Virtue, where, which is the loss of shared moral meanings, yeah. that we don't seem to have a unified moral discourse that people share. So we use the same words, good, bad, right, wrong, evil, but it means so many different things to so many different people that you really don't have a cohesive public anymore that's really talking the same moral language. And is this reversible? Look, uh, religious extremism is on the increase in every religion I know. And the groups in the middle, you know, the, 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 the more tolerant, the more embracing, are in decline everywhere I know. And this is a very difficult phenomenon, and it bodes not well for any of us. And it's not a passing phenomenon. And even if it were a passing phenomenon, it would be incredibly dangerous. Uh, 
And therefore, I think we have to take a stand and say, not to oppose either extreme, but to show there is a compelling alternative, that this idea that we don't share any values is absolutely ridiculous. We all share values. We all value honesty, integrity, decency, mentally, call it what you will. The idea that human beings do not uh, share moral values is ridiculous. And, um, you know, I, I, it is, it's, it's absurd. And that is actually why I reach out to a lot of faiths. Elena and I have as our guests, we do receptions for the leaders of all the faiths in Britain, all the Christian denominations. You think we're divided, they're more divided. Somebody said there are 20,000 different varieties of Christianity. We've only got about 16 of Judaism, you know. We're, we're not the world's most fractious religion. Um, and we bring the Muslims, the Sikhs, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Jains, the Zoroastrian, not to forget the Baha'i. And uh, we're friendly with all of them. And we come together, we pull them together whenever there's a moment of tension or crisis. We bring all the leaders together and we show there is a compelling uh, model of uh, enlightened tolerance. How can, um, from an educational standpoint, um, in your term as chief rabbi, Jewish education in the UK really exploded, yeah. right? There was a tremendous it increase. Grew. In, it grew a lot. exploded right? is probably the wrong word here. <laughs> there was a huge increase in parents sending their kids to schools. But then you have this problem of how can Jewish schools and Jewish educators um, assist students in this very delicate task, right, of both accepting the Western values that they live with, that autonomy, that diversity, but also with the allegiances demanded by Judaism. How can they, it feels sometimes for them, a kind of cognitive split, how can they merge and be Western and Jewish at the same time? First of all, I mean, just in arithmetic terms, uh, 20 years ago we had around between 25 and 30 percent of our children at Jewish day schools. Today, nearly 70 percent. And that is a tremendous transformation, and those schools are our pride and joy, as your schools are rightly your pride and joy. Uh, we have one advantage over you, the government pays for them. Uh, What on earth are we doing underestimating the intelligence of our kids? You think they can't handle a dilemma? Our kids are a lot brighter than we give them credit for. And what we've done as far as we can is what we call an integrated curriculum. If you're studying art, integrate that in your Jewish work, you know. Integrate that into the way kids make their own Haggadot or families together make their own Haggadot. You're doing economics or moral philosophy. Integrate that with the chosen sugyas. We try and make sure that the same critical intelligence they're using in their secular studies, they're using in their Jewish studies, and they are weaving them together. Because don't forget, in Judaism, we believe the God of revelation is the God of creation. So all the secular studies they're studying about God in creation or the nature of creation must dovetail with what they're studying in, in, in Torah, Shebal Peh, and Shebich Tav, uh, assume that they're integrated. The one thing I would challenge, however, is your view that we have to embrace the values of modernity. I am critical of many of the values of modernity. Individualism in modernity has wrecked the single institution that Jews valued more than anything else, and that matters to society more than any, anything else, which is marriage. If we're all individualists, if it's all I, 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 what happened to the we? You know what an I generation this is? You know, um, the Torah was given in our time by the late Steve Jobs of blessed memory, who came down from the mountain with the two tablets, iPad 1 and iPad 2. <laughs> And what is it? iPad, iPhone, iTunes, everything's I, I, I. What about the we? Now, what is the result of that individualist culture? I hope you don't have this in Canada. I profoundly hope you don't. Britain today has the largest percentage 
of teenage pregnancies, the largest percentage of single parent families and the largest percentage of children born outside of marriage in the world. In 2009, in Britain as a whole, 46% of children were born outside of marriage. Now, everyone, all the chattering classes say marriage is only a piece of paper. It is not only a piece of paper. The average length of cohabitation without marriage is less than two years. So you have 46% of children growing up, many of whom never know what is a father. In the mid-80s, a Christian clergyman in Newcastle said to me, Rabbi Sachs, I spent my whole life going around to the children, teaching them Christianity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. I can't do that anymore because there's a word they don't understand. And it isn't God, it's Father. And you know the result of all that? In 2007, UNICEF, the United Nations Children's uh, Branch, published a league table of countries and came up with the discovery that Britain's children are the unhappiest in the world. In, on the 13th of September 2011, just seven weeks ago, a UNICEF follow-up study showed that British parents are trying to buy the affections of their children. They buy them expensive clothes, they buy them the latest smartphone, and the one thing they don't give the children is the one thing the children want. It costs nothing, and it's called time. So it seems to me here that uh, we have to be critical. We have to engage critically with our time. And therefore, I don't use the word modern orthodox, because modern orthodox implies we accept modernity. We don't accept anything then, now, or in the future. We critically engage with. And that is one of the great Jewish contributions to civilization. We were of our time, but we were also of eternity. And therefore, we could be the critical prophetic voice in civilization. I don't actually remember saying that we should embrace the values of modernity. You said they What I said is that my students, my students embrace the values of modernity. <laughs> OK, next time invite me to talk schmooze with your students. <laughs> I mean, seriously, because, you know, um, the values of modernity, some of them are beautiful and some of them are just a wrong turning. I think that, you know, there's a, there's a duality, there's a paradox there, because the very things that we like about modernity, the individualism, the ability to express, the lack of constraint, can also morph into the narcissism and the dysfunctionality that you're talking about, and I think they find it hard to modulate what goes into what? Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is not to forbid. The answer is not to condemn. The answer is not to wag your finger. The truth is kids don't like that, especially uh, once they reach the teenage years. And in my humble view, um, we have to give our children challenges that give them the ability to give us pride. It is my view that children grow to fill the space we create for them. And if that space is small, they'll stay small. And if that space is big, they will grow. Today's society sees kids as mini consumers. Salvation by shopping, which is the new religion. It's amazing, you know. You think I have, you think of Jewish continuity. What do you say about kids, to kids about, uh, Jewish continuity. There is a, an advertisement for a watch I love. I, I hope I will not be taken to task for this. It is called a Patek Philippe. And it says, you never really own a Patek Philippe. You merely hold it in trust for the generations. <laughs> you know, this is crazy. Anyone who believes it. <laughs> Can you imagine holding a Patek Philippe in trust for your grandson's bar mitzvah and you say, I've been holding this in trust for you and turns to a friend and says, what a cheapskate, couldn't buy me this year's model, you know. <laughs> so it is, it is my view that the real way to teach kids is 
to really let them lead. And we do this by encouraging all our schools to have chesed programs and give those kids chesed awards and let them do leadership stuff outside school. And Hevra, I'm going to tell you a story here because, you know, if your parents or grandparents, it's worth knowing this story. Um, you know, Baruch Hashem, uh, I and my brothers did okay academically and my father, Oliver Sean, who, you know, sold schmutters in Commercial Road like New York's Lower East Side, never really succeeded in business. And the family was poor. They came over from Poland when he was young and he had to leave school at the age of 14. And they used to say, Mr. Sachs, how come you had these four bright boys? And he used to say, it's their mother. <laughs> and I used to think, yeah, that's half right. <laughs> but the truth is, I will tell you the answer. I remember this very vividly. When I was four or five years old, I would come back with my dad. We'd be walking back from shul. And I'd ask him, Dad, why did they do this? Or what's the meaning of that? And I, he always answered me the same way. He used to say, Jonathan, I did not have a Jewish education. So I can't answer your questions. But one day, you will have the Jewish education I never had. And when that happens, you will teach me the answers to those questions. And if you want your kids to be good Jews, that's what you say to them. Let your children be your teachers. Don't say negative stuff about the culture. Give them the chance to give you Jewish pride. Chief Rabbi, I'd like to conclude our discussion by returning to future tense. And there you write about the dangers of both a certain kind of universalism and particularism of assimilation on the one side and insularity on the other side as responses to modernity. And it seems like a very difficult balance sometimes because too much engagement can lead to a loss of rooted Jewish identity too much insularity, and Jews are no longer communicating with or in touch with the world at large. So I have two questions. One is, what do you feel Judaism can teach humanity as a whole? And how can we interact with the world without losing ourselves? I can simply tell you what non-Jews want to learn from us. Um, I was so concerned about the decline of the family in Britain that some years ago I made a television documentary on the state of the family for the BBC. It wasn't Jewish, it wasn't religious. And one of the things I did, uh, just out of interest, out of curiosity, is yeah, I invited Britain's leading child care expert, a lady called Penelope Leach, uh, who wasn't Jewish, and you know, I didn't know her, but I thought, let's get a child care expert who knows nothing about Judaism, and come and see what we do in Jewish day schools. Just let us, you know, let's see. She, something may, interesting may come out. So we took her to one of our primary schools uh, on a Friday morning where the kids are doing their mock Shabbat thing, uh, you know, the five-year-old mother and father blessing the five-year-old children and they're the five-year-old Bubba and Zayda and et cetera, et cetera. And she's absolutely gobsmacked. She never saw anything like this before. And she's talking to these five-year-old kids and she's saying, um, uh, what do you like about Shabbos? What don't you like about Shabbos? And the kids were saying, well, Shabbos, can't watch television. It's terrible, it's terrible. <laughs> and what do you like about Shabbos? And this five-year-old boy said, what do I like about Shabbos? It's the only day Daddy doesn't have to rush off. And as we were leaving the school, she turned to me and she said, Chief Rabbi, that Shabbos of yours is saving their parents' marriages. And you know Elaine and I, because we care about good relations with other faiths, 
uh, decided a couple of years ago to spend a week in Amritsar in North India, uh, which is, Amritsa is the Jerusalem of the Sikhs, as the Golden Temple. And we spent a week there with Sikhs, with Hindus, and a week with the Dalai Lama. And uh, you wouldn't believe this, Lo Yuman. We're in uh, a uh, Sikh university in Amritsar with 2,000 Sikhs, I, I, Dalai Lama spoke, I spoke. One of the world's leading Sikhs, Mahinder Singh, stands up in front of 2,000 Sikhs and says, you know what we need? We need Shabbos. <laughs> the Sikhs are very family-minded and very child-focused the way we are. And he said, you know, it's a day where you spend time with the children. You can't buy anything, isn't it? No distraction. I thought, you know, next week I'm going to get him to give that trash in shoe. You know, I... <laughs> Wherever you look, we have a message for humanity. Because we've been around for an awfully long time. Twice as long as Christianity. Three times as long as Islam. Every great empire in antiquity all the way to the present tried to destroy us. Civilizations that seemed invulnerable in their time that bestrode the narrow world like a colossus, whether it was Egypt of the Pharaohs or Assyria or Babylon or the Alexandrian Empire or the Roman Empire or the medieval empires of Christianity and Islam, all the way to the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. Every one of those civilizations is today extinct, and we, this tiny, fragile, vulnerable people of less than one-fifth of one percent of the population of the world can still stand and sing Am Yisrael Chai. Therefore, I say in future tense at the end that Judaism is the voice of hope in the conversation of humankind. And I also believe, and although we're not going to stray into this territory, that if people would approach politics with an open mind, they would look at this tiny, fragile, vulnerable state of Israel and see what it has done with a smaller population and a younger age than any country in the Middle East how it is enhanced the sciences and the arts and the humanities, the chain of their medical services, how it taught the world how to farm, how it taught the world the most advanced medical techniques, how it taught the world how out of this resource-free zone it focused on human capital, on human beings as infinitely valuable, and out of that created some of the world's leading technologies, Israel is the voice of hope for small, young nations. People, if Israel can do it, others can do it. That is the message that we have to deliver again and again and again. It will be good for the world, and it will be good for us. Too often Judaism is beset with Kleinstädtel politics. Toronto is a total exception. <laughs> Do we have to sit in this tiny little space arguing with one another? Let us go out to the world and say, Rabosai, you know, we don't claim to have the monopoly over truth. We think by mere bistushain, you Sikhs and Hindus and Muslims and Christians and even Richard Dawkins, may Hashem preserve him at Larichus Yomim. You're beautiful. If God could see the good in everything, so can we. And we can say to them, Rabosai, you have a problem. This is how we, over 4,000 years of reflection, address that problem. If it works for you, have it. And if it doesn't work for you, as Nishkefelach. Judaism is the least threatening religion in the world, unless you happen to be Jewish. But I mean... <laughs> We have a message to say to the world, so let us say it out there. Let us, 
you know, I'm sure it's happening in Toronto, it's happening in London, all the hotshot law firms put up a sucker. For heaven's sake, you know, I, I don't know if you even saw this in New York, on the Occupy Wall Street, they put up a sucker. Did you see this? They put up a sucker and this black cop, it's a true story, came in and he looked at the schach and they said, what are you looking at? He said, I just wanted to see if you could see the sky through the schach. I just wanted to be kosher. You know, a true story was in the news a couple of weeks ago. You know, wear our Judaism with pride and it'll be good for us. We will breathe a larger air. It'll be good for the world and we will all benefit. And is it? Difficult? Yes. Is it fraught with risk? Yes. Should we be afraid? No. Because if we truly believe the words we say in Dublin every day or every year, then we know that faith must conquer fear. And simply to sum up that message, if that's my last little thing before I go and sign the books and you get a bit of fresh air and stuff, I will tell you a little story and with, with, with this I will end because we've just been through all the Chagim. And uh, I don't know, is, is Canadian English more like English English or American English? Kacha. <laughs> it's the usual Canadian confusion. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, in American English, there's a wonderful word that we don't have in English English. The word through, which means up to and including, right? We don't have that in English English. And this created an enormous problem. I don't know if you know this. Um, there's a machlokes aposkim, machlokes achronim, as to whether you, s how long do you say la David Hashem Orivish? If you start on, on the first of Elul, till when do you say it? Do you say it until Hoshana Rabbah, or do you say it uh, up to Shmini Do you say it on Shmini Atzeres? And yesh poskim lekan, yesh lekan, it's actually a geographical uh, difference. The East Europeans tend to say it Shmini Atzeres, the West tended to say it only up to Hoshana Rabbah. And for uh, over a hundred years, the rubric of the Anglo-Jewish prayer book, which only changed when I did our new Siddha, said, it said, till Shmini Atzeris. And the word till in English, English, is ambiguous between up to and including, or up to but not including. So the rubric was, you know, a tremendous help on this one. So. My Seshahaya, this is a true story, it happened before we were born, but it happened in the 20th century that on Shmini Atzeris, in an Orthodox shul in London, the Chazan got up and started saying, Le David Hashem Arivishi. The Gabba got up and said, Sha! <laughs> the Chazan said, But you say, Le David Hashem Arivishi on Shmini Atzeris. And the Gabba said, You don't say, Le David Hashem on Shmini Atzeris. The chazan said, but I'm the chazan, and I'm going to say it. And the gabba said, but I'm the gabba, you're fired. <laughs> True story. The chazan brought a case against the gabba for unfair dismissal. The case came to an English civil court in front of a non-Jewish judge who had to decide the entire basis of the case on whether you do or you don't. Say, <laughs> David Hashem, Ari Biyushi. You're a Gentile, what do you do on this? <laughs> Certainly don't ask her off. <laughs> <laughs> the judge, Chacham Enav Barosho, had the wisdom of Solomon. He had the psalm read out in court, in English. And he said, you know, I think that psalm is so beautiful. I think you should say it every day. <laughs> the chazan got his job back and peace was restored. <laughs> Tishma. David Hashem Arivishi Mimi Ra Hashem Ozchayai Mimi Efchad. God is my light and my salvation. Of whom then shall I be afraid? God is the refuge of my life. Whom then shall I fear? Let us live our Judaism with faith in Hashem and fear of no one. 
and we will be a blessing to the world and a source of nachas to Hashem. Thank you. I'm going to ask Rabbi Chaim Strachler to say the official thank you. We have all just witnessed something extremely special. In a world in which Judaism is often seen as being something which is of the past, we have heard it described in the most relevant and the most powerful of, of words. In a world in which Judaism is often attempted to be sectioned off and hidden away where it can be protected, we have heard a vision of how Judaism is meant to change the world and change our lives. We've heard the story of the University of London's student union and the plaque on the wall. And I would encourage everyone here to see within the chief rabbi's words an example. And I'm not expecting each and every person here to develop the wisdom or the eloquence of Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. But everyone here has doors that you walk through. And you can put plaques, you can put the words in front of those doors. And the people that you speak to, what you've heard this more, this after this evening, is what is described in our parsha as being kore b'shem Hashem, a calling out in God's name. And it's not just rabbis who can do so. Each of us has the ability to be kore b'shem Hashem, to follow Avraham's example, and to follow Chief Rabbi's example. I encourage you to read his words. There are a number of books available outside that you can purchase. There are books available in the libraries here in Shari Shemayim and libraries around the world. Go read and go take words. Take page 58 <laughs> and put it in your pockets. Put it in your pocket and tell your friends. Because the, these messages are things that can change our lives, that can change our worlds. On behalf of Shari Shemayim, on behalf of the Toronto Jewish community, I'd like to thank Torah in Motion for bringing in Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and bringing in people like Rabbi Jonathan Sachs on a regular basis to our community and allowing those words of being Korei B'Shem Hashem to reverberate here within our community and from Toronto to the entire world. And I'd like to also on behalf of our community thank by Jonathan Sachs for taking the time to share his message with us and giving us the chance to do, to follow in his example and to hear his words and to teach his words to others. Thank you.